Hello and welcome to video 5 of our entrepreneurship and e-commerce course and today we are looking at industry and competitor analysis and actually today's video is just going to focus on industry analysis um, so hopefully we look at industry analysis we're going to look at some environmental and business trends uh, we've already discussed this in previous videos so we won't go into it in too much detail we're going to look at Porter's five force model. Uh, what is the five force model? Um, and we look at a couple of industry types just to give you an idea of the different types of industry as well. Um, okay, so uh, just to, again a little bit of a recap. Industry analysis already in, the, in this uh, collection of videos we've looked at doing a business plan and we've looked at generating ideas and feasibility analysis and um, marketing and today we're doing industry analysis which is an important part of of any business plan and i guess an important part of uh, any new startup company um, it's, it's so important that you understand the industry that you're getting into and all the intricacies and things that surround the industry particularly if you're inexperienced in that industry well then industry analysis is of the utmost importance but even if you are experienced and are setting up a new business it is important to look at the industry because you know there could be certain trends within the industry that affect profitability uh, there can be certain things happening like the industry declining or increasing uh, depending on what's going on at that time um, so we're just going to look at, at that today and, and, and how uh, a Porter's five force model is, is something uh, that is good. And again, I mean, industry analysis, while we're looking at it for this course as part of an assessment, well, think of it more as, you know, the business that you're setting up is something that you're really interested in, whether that's a fashion business or a computer game business or fitness uh, business whatever it is you know what you're really doing in industry analysis is you're doing research that that you're going to find interesting because it's interesting to to the thing that you're interested in and um, so uh, when I was doing this all the way back when I, I used to apply it to the restaurant industry because you know I was interested in food and um, drink and stuff like that so I used to apply um, a lot of it to, to, to make sense. I, I draw examples from the restaurant industry but today we'll, we'll draw examples from multiple different industries, uh, old traditional industries and maybe new uh, technological industries. So an industry uh, first is and we've covered this already but an industry is a group of firms or companies that produce a similar product or services such as airlines fitness drinks furniture electronic games and you know the list goes on and on cars etc but it's basically in this an industry we can classify as a, a group of companies producing a similar product or service uh, so industry analysis is the business uh, research that focuses on the potential of that industry. When we say the potential, we, we often mean profitability of, of the industry, uh, the potential to be successful in that industry. So, and that's what we're researching um, on. Once it is determined that the new venture, uh, you know, that is feasible and, and we've done feasibility and feasibility is whether this idea that we've come up with is worth pursuing and we, we've, if we've got this far to writing a business plan then we already know that this venture is worth pursuing and uh, now in regard to the industry and market in which we'll compete, a more in-depth analysis is needed to learn about the industry and to learn the ins and outs of the industry and you know that's what we're doing no matter what your industry is in you, the more information you have on that industry uh, well the better your better informed your decisions will be on what you do within the industry uh, so let's move on um, studying industry trends and again an important uh, part of industry analysis is looking at trends within the industry and indeed um, you know external to the industry and we can often say these are macro or uh, 
uh, macro or environmental trends and they can include things like economic trends, uh, what way is the current economy of the country, um, social trends, what is happening in society at the minute that is trending a lot, um, technological advances, do we look at artificial intelligence or VR or, or anything, can we introduce that into our industry, are there any political trends? Um, and, you know, so, for example, if we took the petroleum industry at the moment, you know, you could say that, well, economically, it's sort of in decline. The, the value of, of, of a lot of uh, petrol at the minute is down. Um, companies like Shell and BP, the, the value of it is down. Things that are trending at the minute is, is environmental friendliness and alternative gases, uh, alternative sources of energy. So, you know, that's something you'd have to be uh, aware of. Technological advances, political, um, you know, maybe Donald Trump in America we see at the minute is up for re-election. And I guess if you were um, a petroleum company, you might be hoping that he would get in because he supports that. So again, these these external things that we can't control uh, influence our industry. Uh, I have here, for example, industries that sell products to seniors are benefiting by the age of the population. And vice versa here, actually, in Bahrain at the minute, we can say that um, we have a, a, a boom of young adults at the minute, and, and there are certain technologies that benef benefit from that. Um, other business trends, uh, so you know, we we have to look at trends within each indi individual uh, industry to see, you know, well, what way are they performing overall? Is the industry doing well? Um, you know, obviously, we're living in, in at this moment in time through coronavirus, so a lot of industries are struggling. But if I was doing an analysis of the industry, I'd be, I'd be looking at well, what companies with the industry are doing well, and why are they doing well? What parts of, are responding well? And you know, if we look at the coronavirus overall, we can see that certain industries are doing well. Online companies are are uh, improving a lot more. Takeaway companies um, are, are trending upwards and quite successful. So uh, these kind of um, uh, trends we, we have to pay attention to. And again, um, you know, it's the more information and the more research that you have on, on these trends, uh, well, the better prepared you are uh, for creating your business plan, but also for making the right decisions for your new company. We're just going to look at a couple of industry types here just so that you're familiar with them and uh, we won't spend too long but basically the first one we're looking at is emerging industry and this is industries in which standard operating procedures have yet to be developed so they're pretty new industries and, and uh, they're being disrupted and re uh, pivoting and changing every day and, and there's no uh, clear drivers within the industry, yet there's still people fighting to be the top companies within these industries and we can couple of examples here of AI and robotics and virtual reality you know there's no company that we associate with virtual reality yet head and shoulders above any other company you know there's no Nike of virtual reality there's no uh, uh, Nike of self-driving cars although we might say that um, Tesla I suppose uh, are maybe a company that are, are doing a lot in this area um, Fragmented industries then are just industries that are characterized by a large number of companies or firms or businesses that are pretty much the same size. And we call that a fragmented industry. So restaurants, car dealerships, you know, we can say that your McDonald's and your uh, Burger Kings and your Jasmine's and um, Subways and all these restaurants, because sort of no, not one of them, is, if you like, is um, significantly dominating the rest of them. They're all sort of equal, small sized restaurants. Uh, car dealerships kind of the same. You've got your Fords and your Toyotas and uh, your Kias and Mazdas. Uh, mature industries, uh, I, uh, I suppose you could say industries to avoid but not necessarily because with the development in technologies and things like that there and um, uh, you know w 
they can be disrupted and reinvented and come out even stronger. Um, uh, so mature industries, for example, are ex uh, industries that are experiencing slow or no increase in demand. And um, the automotive industry, petroleum industry, tobacco industry are some examples of them. But again, uh, with the introduction of certain technologies, uh, that's not to say that these don't have the potential for entrepreneurial development. Uh, declining industries are industries that are experiencing a reduction in demand, so uh, coal mining is sort of a declining industry at the moment because particularly say where I'm from in Ireland or the UK, uh, any new houses I don't think you're allowed to ha even have an open fireplace so uh, there's no need for coal for the house, do, we, do many places use it for heating, it's not used for travel or, or anything so it's sort of an industry that you could suggest is in, in decline like the railroad travel which you know okay maybe it's it's uh, it's still in existence but competing against other modes of transport um, is probably declining a little bit uh, DVD rental of course is a declining industry if not nearly dead <laughs> Global industries are industries that are experiencing significant international sales and pharmaceuticals, IT, clothing, media uh, could all be examples of those industries. So I just wanted to introduce you to those couple of concepts before we moved on to the five force model, uh, which is a model uh, that we will look at now. Uh, so the five force model or Porter's five force model or the five competitive forces in the model um, so the five competitive force model is a, is a framework or a model for understanding the structure of an industry so it's something that we would use to help us understand the structure of the industry and what we mean by that is you know how the on the industry uh, is what it is like what is happening with the industry is it in a strong place is it in a weak place what are what are all the things that are happening in this particular industry and it's important to know that again that information is power and and you know it can help us make certain decisions on on the uh, uh, the business so the model is composed of forces and five forces uh, that we call them forces that determine the industry profitability and that's important uh, so each force uh, will tell you uh, basically if uh, it gives you an indication if you like uh, whether the industry will be profitable or not and if all five of the forces are low um, well then we can suggest that the uh, industry is not very profitable and if, if they are high then we can say it is profitable and we'll, we'll look at that in more detail in a moment uh, so they help determine the average rate of return for the company in an industry and we look at that uh, it's not quite as simple or as quantitative as as an exact rate of return but it gives you a good idea of profitability and, and how much money you can get back in your investment each of the five forces impacts the average rate of return so each uh, force does have an impact yeah and well-managed companies or firms or businesses try to position their company in a way that avoids or diminishes these forces so again maybe sounds like gobbledygook until we we look at each one so let's look at each one and see if we can flesh this out a little bit more uh oh so sorry why use the five force model um the five force model can be used to assess the attractiveness of an industry by determining the level of threat to the industry profitability of each forces and i think we covered that in the last slide so but we're basically saying that um you know this model that we use will basically tell us uh, what the threat is like for profitability, if, if it's a high threat or a low threat. Um, and here we're just saying in the next, next uh, slide we can see that we've got uh, what we would call a, a little model and we'll discuss this in class more but basically you're going to look at threat of substitutes, threat of new entrants, rivalry among each other. These are our five forces and we'll go through each of these in uh, detail now and then we put a tick beside which one uh, that we're going to place them in and again I would like you to do this for your uh, assessment where you're creating a business plan for your new idea I would like you to uh, res you know discuss each of these and then fill in this diagram okay 
So the five forces model, the five forces, threat of substitute, threat of new entrants, rivalry among existing firms, bargaining power of suppliers and bargaining power of buyers. And, and we'll discuss each of them now. So the threat of substitutes, basically within an industry, the price that consumers or customers are willing to pay for a product will depend in part on the availability of substitute products. And for example, there are few, if any, substitutes for prescription medic medicines, which is one of the reasons the pharmaceutical industry is so profitable. So we're using the pharmaceutical industry here uh, as a good example of um, where not many substitute products exist for certain uh, things. And again, pharmaceutical companies, the development of a product might take 10 years. So it's financially very expensive. So not too many companies are will have the finances to be developing uh, these products. And indeed, if another company is a couple of years ahead, then they may not even bother getting interested in developing a product uh, um, because of, of how far ahead the other company might be. Uh, so we can say that not many substitute products exist and, um, you know, of course, in, in the treatment of a very, a very bad sickness, um, well, you know, we're willing to pay high price for that and if there's not many uh, substitute products for that uh, medicine, then, you know, we can say that it's very profitable. You know, however, uh, in contrast, uh, when close substitute products exist, well, the profit is lower uh, because consumers can opt out if the prices get too high. And we, we will maybe here I've uh, listed a number of examples and I'll let you click. Sorry, it's a website with a number of examples. And I'm going to let you click on uh, it for examples of things that uh, have high or low uh, substitute products. But, you know, you could you could ask, um, what is the substitute product? Uh, product uh, for example if I was to open up a, um, a digital marketing company tomorrow are, are there many substitute products out there well there probably are because there's quite a lot of say for example design companies there might be quite a lot of marketing companies and um, so they can get sort of similar products from me they can even do online courses that teach them how to do digital marketing and um, so we can say that there's a lot of substitute products out there um, mobile phones again there may be lots of substitute products there's lots of different types of mobile phones but you know you might even say well um, you know I don't need a smartphone I can get a cheap phone and then I, I can get a um, like a cheap camera and a cheap uh, uh, tablet and, and it's got all the benefits of a smartphone <laughs> uh, but they are substitutes or indirect substitutes of, of the product um, soft drinks there's lots of uh, substitute for for soft drinks so in theory if coca-cola decided to put their can up by two or three pound or euro or bd in the next uh, week well people will stop buying coca-cola they're they're not going to pay five bd for a can of coca-cola they'll they'll um uh go for the cheaper substitute version of coca-cola which would be another can of cola or maybe fanta or something else uh, again, just some examples there for you to click on yourself uh, and we'll discuss this in, in more detail in our Q&A session uh, in our next class. Um, threat of new entrants. If a, uh, sorry, if a company in an industry, uh, sorry, if the companies in an industry are highly profity, profitable, then the industry becomes a magnet to new entrants. That, what that sort of means is, uh, for example, again, maybe uh, say a digital marketing company sets up 10 years ago. It's a new company in a new industry because there are not many digital marketing companies out there. And very quickly, that digital marketing company becomes successful because it's offering good solutions to its clients and it's getting good prices. And then, you know, maybe another digital marketing company comes in and realizes that this is a profitable industry and it's going well. Um, well, then all of a sudden, you might see more uh, um, companies seeing that there's lots of profit in this uh, industry and they might start uh, opening up more and more uh, 
digital marketing companies because there's lots of potential for making money in this area. Uh, so, and, and, and maybe another example, uh, if you look at the minute sort of drop shipping websites using AliExpress and Shopify, they can be quite profitable and we can see more and more people recognizing this and getting into that, uh, particularly say if you are a web media student and you've got web media skills and you have the capability of creating websites, well it's very cheap to, to set up a, a drop shipping website and create a little company for yourself and uh, very quickly you're selling products which are, are going to drive down the price um, of, of you know your competitors so the industry can become less profitable uh, if there are a lot of new entrants uh, so if the threat of new entrances is, if it's easy for new entrants to enter the market well then the profitability comes down and I think you could use actually the the, uh, the design industry here because the threat of entering is quite low. For example, a graduate might set up a new design company very quickly because it doesn't cost much to set up a design company, so it's easy to set it up. Um, whereas to set up a new pharmaceutical company, well, that's very expensive and you have to spend a lot of money uh, over a prolonged period of time developing uh, products that you're going to sell. Uh, so firms in an industry try to keep a number of new entrants low by creating barriers and this kind of makes sense if, if there's a couple of you in the industry as I said if there's only two or three of, of, of companies in Bahrain providing digital marketing solutions well it's in that company and industry's interest to try and make it difficult for people to enter the industry so uh, they may try and stop students from setting up companies well, how do they do that? Uh, and we call these barriers uh, to to new entries. Um, we'll go through some of them. Uh, product differentiation. Uh, so industries such as the soft drink industry that are characterized by firms with strong brands are difficult to break into without spending heavily on advertising. And what we're saying there is, you know, one of the barriers to the soft drinks industry uh, is that it's already established by some huge companies like um, Coca-Cola and Pepsi and Dr. Pepper and Red Bull and uh, I think Red Bull were, were you know, maybe 10, 20 years old that they've sort of broken into that fizzy drink, soft drink market. Um, but that would be a barrier to entry. Capital requirements is the need to invest large amounts of money to gain entry into an industry. So again, like we said, the pharmaceutical in industry, you need to spend lots of money to, to get into that industry. Um, let's have a look. Access to distribution channels. Uh, well, we can say access... Uh, you know, you have to have access to to uh, selling your product and the ability to distribute your product, and in some places that can be can be difficult. And the example here is convenience stores. Um, you know, you can't just start making jam and uh, rock up to the local uh, convenience store and say, "Here, can you sell my uh, jam?" Because uh, a number of reasons. Usually, bigger companies will have uh, contracts in place or priorities that you know. Look, if you're selling our jams, we want them placed here, and uh, we don't sell what you sell in other types of jams or things like that. There. There are just some threats of new entrants. There, you can look through them all yourself. Uh, uh, and use which ones you feel will be applicable to your business plan when you are doing it for your new business. There are what we call non-traditional barriers to entry. Um, it, for example, it is difficult for a new company to create barriers because you're just a new company, and and you know particularly in in modern technology when new companies are starting every day with new great ideas of innovation technology well how do they sort of create barriers to other people coming in and, and, and stealing their profits uh, or ideas uh, so um, we look at some non-traditional barriers and again we won't go through them all strength of a management team um, first mover advantage this is a good one if, if a, a company uh, as a first mover in an, uh, in the industry, then you know can establish a, rec a reputation early on, and uh, you know with its suppliers and distributors, and it can create good relationships with these uh, suppliers and distributors and customers before anybody else gets in. So if you're the first person to to uh, be doing this type of 
business, then you know you can take advantage of that by creating good relationships uh, all around you. Passion of the management team and employees is fairly straightforward. A unique business model, so you know, for example, um, what would be an example of a unique business model? Uh, I suppose uh, Dell's online ordering model would be quite unique in that you can uh, custom make your PCs. Uh, Uber's business model was quite unique when it first came out in terms of um, in terms of uh, uh, using technology uh, and inventing a new approach to industry. Uh, okay, so they're just some examples of threats of new entrants. Uh, but basically, what we can take before we move on is that. Uh, if it is easy for new entrants to to enter an industry, well then the threat is high. If it is difficult for new entrants to enter the industry, then the threat is low. And obviously we want it to be difficult and we want the threat to be low because it means there's more profits for those that are already in the industry. Uh, this is a nice simple one. Rivalry among existing firms, if in, in most industries, uh, a major determinant of profitability can be the level of competition among the companies that are already in that industry. Some industries are fiercely competitive to the point where prices are pushed below the level of cost uh, and industry-wide losses occur. In other industries, competition is much less intense and price competition is subdued. And we are going to discuss some of those examples, but we're going to wait for our class to discuss them. Uh, bargaining power of suppliers, and this basically just is where the, supp the supplier has the power, if you like. Uh, suppliers can suppress the profitability of, of the industry uh, to which they sell by raising prices or reducing the quality of the components they provide. And, you know, if we think, we'll think of a couple of examples here, but for example, the airline industry, well, suppliers may have the power there. For example, suppliers of oil, well, there's not many suppliers and uh, they're going to dictate the price of the oil that, that the airlines are using. So it's not like the airlines can go, well, we're not using you, we'll use someone that's a lot cheaper because they won't find someone that's a lot cheaper. Um, and, you know, it's much the same if I owned a restaurant and uh, my local butcher decides to put up the price. Uh, well, I have to make a decision. Do I put up the price in my restaurant uh, or do I find a new butcher? And is the new butcher going to be as good a quality for the same price? So, you know, it depends. Uh, the, you know, uh, and what we look at uh, when we're doing the analysis here is we find out if uh, the threat of, of the, the power of suppliers is high and if, if it's high that means the suppliers have the power and if it's low uh, it means that you know there's lots of suppliers for that industry uh, so and we can say maybe for restaurants that there are lots of suppliers to the industry but it depends on what type of restaurant you are if you're a high-end restaurant and maybe you know you need quality and maybe there are not many as as many suppliers uh, if the suppliers are powerful relative to the company and the industry to which they sell, in this industry profitability can suffer. And that kind of makes sense. If the supplier has the power, they can set prices high, and then that means your profits will be lower because customers may not pay the price uh, if you set the price high. Uh, some things that can uh, uh, influence uh, the power of suppliers, uh, supplier concentration, where there are only a few suppliers that supply a critical product to a large number of buyers, the supplier has an advantage. So, a few suppliers, but lots of buyers. <laughs> Simple supply and demand, really. <laughs> switching costs can be expensive, uh, so switching from one supplier to the other. Uh, attractiveness of substitutes. And the threat of forward integration is just one to be aware of the power of a supplier is enhanced if there is a credible possibility that the supplier might enter the buyer's industry and an example of this would be uh, well Samsung used to supply uh, iPhone screens and of course they have entered the smartphone industry so uh, they that was a, what you would call a threat of forward integration. So again, uh, and we've seen this if we use the restaurant example, um, it's not on, well, I've some examples where uh, 
uh, butchers might decide to open up a butcher shop restaurant as well um, or vice versa I think some might decide to sell some restaurants that might decide to sell their meat as well <laughs> maybe that's a bad example <laughs> Bargaining power of buyers, which is quite similar to the power of suppliers, except it is the buyers that have the, the 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 power. And if we were to use the airline industry again as an example, well, you could say that buyers probably have the power in the airline industry because they have lots of uh, price compare sites. They can you know look at uh, uh, different airlines and choose different companies and different uh, websites uh, to see if they can get cheaper prices maybe uh, hotels would be the same there's lots of comparing hotel websites out there and uh, if the buyer doesn't like the price on one site or with the hotel itself then it might go to another uh, site or hotel uh, so buyers can suppress the profitability of the industry uh, from which they buy depending on uh, by demanding price concessions or increasing quality and I think that, yeah, that is the, the five forces. So the five forces, again, power of buyers, the bargaining power of suppliers, the rivalry among existing firms, and the uh, substitute, threat of substitute products and threat of new entrants. And uh, for the business plan that you will be doing, uh, you will have to do a five force analysis of the industry that your company is entering. We will discuss this with more examples in a little bit more detail in our next class, uh, which deals with this. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. Again, it was just an introduction to these concepts and ideas, and I hope it made sense to you. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or leave a message under uh, in the comments box. Uh, um, yeah. So thank you, have a good day and talk soon.